we begin. Welcome Uma Prajapati, the co-founder of Upasana, uh, based out of Oroville, which is uh, a city of tomorrow in Pondicherry in the south of India. And uh, we're doing this Shakti dialogue uh, between you and me in the presence of our Shakti fellowship uh, members. These are women from all over the world. I've also invited Chandani uh, Jafri, who's a is a you know, potential Shakti fellow maybe in the next batch so she can get a sense of what's going on here. All of you are in some form or shape um, looking to be change makers um, in a way that's sustainable. So you are also social entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs. And um, the reason we're doing this Shakti dialogue with Uma is because she in a way has been a trailblazer and she's already a very established and very successful conscious entrepreneur in such a deep sense of the word that I'm delighted that we get to do our first enrichment call with a guest speaker uh, being Uma. Uh, there's, there's, there's no one I can think of who would better exemplify everything that uh, we aspire for as uh, Shakti preneurs. Okay, so welcome Uma. Uh, your website link was shared, your PDF was shared, so I hope the women have had some sense of uh, what you do. Mm -hmm. But why don't we begin with you actually describing where you are sitting right now, so that we land with you where you are, and you know how intentional your space is. So please go ahead and tell us about it. So I'm sitting in the forest of Oroville in my house called Ashwini. And I'm in my bedroom. This is my favorite place that I lean against my bed. And it's the place I meditate, I write, and I, I just be with myself. And uh, even that I share, uh, I, I have a boyfriend and we live together. We don't share bedroom. It's my room and it's my space. <laughs> and, and I just love that. And, and so I'm, I'm actually sitting in my most favorite space. And that's where when I'm quiet, I want to be. And I write and yeah, and it's, uh, I'm not in office space at all. It's, uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm just in my bedroom, just cozy and being with myself. And, and I also realized that this is what we don't give it to ourselves very often that there are so much things either happening around or we choose to look like in a certain way. So when I got this opportunity that you have this as a potential to honor yourself and create a space you love to be in. And I have one, so here, welcome. Literally in my bedroom, it's a small <laughs> one, but it's a, it's a very nice one behind is my bed and, and, and the wooden uh, partition where I lean and have my meditation when I get up in the night and I just want to get up and sit and have my spine straight and, and be silent, that's what I do. So, there I am. Tell us about the symbols above you and uh, they're in gold on wood, right? Uh, yeah, it's Torquil's work. Torquil is a, uh, he's my partner and he's an economist and uh, uh, mathematician. But right now he works with wood and uh, he's from Denmark. So, he has this Scandinavian design sensibility in wood, which is very, very nice. This particular one is a partition, which is... Uh, done in a traditional craft of uh, wood carving. He used the local craft of Tamil Nadu, a wood carver, but he filled it with gold paint. And it uh, also inspired in, in that, that there is a sense of our inner space, which comes through all the way, no matter what. So there are a, a kind of a space around, which is creepers kind of space, and in that, this one vertical palm tree is going upward. And it has also a symbolism of articulating the core being in us. And it's beautiful. It's actually very beautifully done. Thanks, Uma. And I know earlier when you were moving the camera, I could see the mother symbol. And I don't know if Sri Aurobindo is on the other side, but why don't you all, not everyone knows about Oroville. So can yeah. you very briefly in just two minutes or so give us 
what is Oroville and what brings you there to work, do your work from a place like Oroville? Uh, so let me just tell you about where I live and what this place is and how did I land up here. So I was in Delhi and I came to a place called Oroville is an international spiritual township in southernmost part of India, close to Pondicherry and nearest airport is uh, Chennai. Now even Pondicherry has an airport, not very active though, it's a small one. So it is, uh, it, uh, uh, this township called Oroville is a community where right now we have 57 nationalities living. So it's truly an international place, diverse. And uh, it's an international spiritual township. So very center of it, uh, we have a meditation place, which we call Matri Mandir. And for me, it's a temple of the mother, which also for me means the temple of femininity. And that would uh, interest you guys, the Shakti entrepreneur, that there is this city really honors the woman. And woman in a highest form, we call her the mother. And in, in even in Sri Bindo's, uh, philosophy, he says that divine inaction is female. So there is a lot of uh, Shakti living happening in Orville. And uh, it really wishes to live a conscious life and be a want to be the city which Earth needs. And we see ourselves as an experiment uh, uh, final for uh, being a guinea pig happily. And we do a lot of work with that. Most of the work is more, uh, uh, how you say that? It's more like experimenting. So when I do my work, I'm actually trying to experiment if business, a yoga of business is possible. And if it is that, what that would be? Our master and the leader, Sri Aurobindo, he says, whole life is yoga. And he talks about integral yoga. And I have been dwelling on that particular word that if life is about integrality and yoga is integral, what that will be in action. And especially when you are an entrepreneur and you are dealing with matters and you're dealing with money and power and people and impact and so on, where does it lead us? Will it lead me to my salvation? Will it lead me to my enlightenment? And that is what Upasanas had been and how, how this beauty would become whole and not to just be on a beautiful dress or a beautiful uh, blouse or fashion is all about beauty and vanity. We talk about beauty, which is so bloody superficial. And, and in that field, I'm sitting and trying to contemplate in the forest of Oroville, will this beauty, can it go a little a step higher? Is that a possibility? Will I kill I, 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 myself and as an organization that we believe that to run a business successful, you need to cut somewhere, some corner. There are fears that we have, our, our decisions are taken in the fear ways. So my journey of uh, Oroville began when I came here in 96 for a design project. As a professional, I had finished my design education and I was working in Delhi. I had my peak of my career, I wanted to have a, a, a small break and came to a place called Oroville for a two weeks design project in 96 February. And uh, it's still on. My two weeks is still on. So um, I did not go back to Delhi and continued my life. And I never looked back. I never looked back uh, what life could have been. I just feel like I'm born here and such a sense of deep alignment and uh, able to manifest that in work, I feel utterly great. I can't imagine what would have been uh, made out of me if I was continuing to live in Delhi, the city and capital of, of India and such a buzz place. So here, here I am and a uh, lot many things are happening apart from Upasana. There are very, very interesting projects. There are many interesting experiments and our biggest uh, target we look at as objective is arriving at human unity, arriving at a possibilities that all different nationalities live together. So human unity is very uh, huge uh, importance to us. And uh, yeah, that's all in nutshell. If you ask question, I might just 
dwell upon in different dimension of what happens but to be in oroville is a lifetime honor for me thank you uma and uh, as you were saying you have become an entrepreneur around conscious fashion but there are so many orovillians doing equally conscious things like organic farming and or conscious architecture and uh, renewable energy and uh, i mean it's it's such a fountain of conscious creativity conscious innovation and uh, my experience every time i come you know it's not as if it's one little utopia la la land half of it you know the mother who was visual this was she basically says if you're going to work out human unity all the possible misaligned forces of of humanity and the world will show up here in order to be harmonized because otherwise until everything has been included we are not going to experience human unity and so all different thought forms and viewpoints and perspectives and every single piece out there the entire diversity of the world shows up through the people there and so i know it's literally like a crucible and of alchemy and burn you know there is it's it's a sadhana it's a tapasya it's a uh, you know it's it's really the it, living in oroville requires your deepest wells of resilience and uh, sincerity uh, in surrender to this higher force that assures you that i am here just work with me and be inspired by me be an instrument for me right this is what that higher divine mother's force is saying to you when you're in orovillian and to kind of live and work with that attitude brings out every possible ego challenge on a daily basis <laughs> yeah. so and, and also that this possibility that uh, everybody a kind of a think alike in a deeper sense even that we have a superficial sense of conflict sometime but we all have chosen to be there and this this sense of community and atmosphere it is so so needed for our growth acceleration goes in a very high speed over here and in city you need to hand pick people who you can align with over here we are bundle of us we are like all pretty much similar so we don't seek alignment and uh, we don't have to go and hunt for people you you open your eyes and person in front of has a same madness as you are in and that's beautiful yeah that's beautiful. that's that's a very good um, you know uh, thing to call out that you're already working with people who have heard the call and answered the call yeah yeah so right there your foundations are true and now you can work out the discordance from there you know yeah 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 that's right. um <clears throat> so now going deeper into your own brand of uh, of upasana basically what you're looking to create is conscious fashion and i met you rather you know i asked that you you come to uh, the mercedes benz fashion week in yeah. colombo yeah. and then we got to spend so much time together which was amazing uh, with this amazing entrepreneur who her name yeah. is mrs feldwind i hope to bring her on as a next uh, shakti uh, pranar to uh, have a dialogue with um but uma you and i heard what the world speakers on fashion were telling us that uh, yeah. fashion is the number two most polluting industry in the world after oil and gas so yeah. that is a terrible terrible you know uh, status to have and um, that's because fashion has become so consumer oriented there are so many almost every month becomes a uh, you know a new line to launch and and 80% of clothes go into landfills as crazy as that 80% so uh, there is something so unconscious about the world of fashion can you tell us how you in your own way are trying to flip it in your area of influence how do you make fashion conscious what are some of the principles you work with for example talk about your supply chain and the circularity of your supply chain describe a little bit about circularity because this group may not know what circularity is okay so i'm going to start with saying how we think initially when i live in oroville and 
being silent and being reflective is part of your life. That everything we kind of look around and saying, hey, what impact it is making on home and what it is doing. So that's very, very essential to be able to reflect on what we do. We somehow live sometime in a rut of living and so powerfully it drives us that we don't even know what are we doing and why are we doing and so on. So this sense of reflection is given to us over here. And when I started reading Sri we talked about integral yoga and the question of integral business came to me that if, if life is, whole life is yoga and if it is time for integral yoga, then what I am doing? I'm dealing with what I'm dealing with and being an entrepreneur. Can I transform this space? Will business transform this space? Can we create a yoga of business? And that led me into looking at the whole circularity of what's going on around fashion. I wasn't, I wasn't so aware of it. But when I ended up uh, working with the weavers in Benares as a social project, and we were taking few hundreds weavers, 50,000 weavers were on the street looking for job and BBC broadcasting it in an international platform. India, it wasn't even news. We had so much to do that time. It was 2006, February, that there was a BBC news internationally and weavers and Benares are in crisis. And I happened to get involved into that project and it, it changed my life. And I worked there for nine years and it has taken to places after and recognition and so on. But that is like not so important. What was the, what we are able to do with this community which make this fashion happen to begin with, who adds beauty and who add, gives us a sense of aesthetics and beauty in our, all our Indian weddings where most of the saris are coming from there and this community has made clothes for royalty. So how can the royalty people who, who made luxury, defined luxury for the kings, today are, are at the state of begging and, and driving rickshaw and being construction laborer to be able to live? I couldn't comprehend. But that changed my life. And it was, uh, initially it was a, uh, uh, corporate gifting project that I ended up making uh, some 13, 15,000 a scarf as a Christmas gift for a big uh, company in Denmark, Bessela. And uh, I'm very grateful that the, that company thought about creating their corporate gifting that year from a weavers in India in Benares and I became instrumental of delivering that project. So of course I did that and it was very well received and I got a phone call from Denmark saying, aren't you, we are so happy to see this gift you have done for us and it's fabulous project, time delivery, excellent, execution, very good, aesthetics, very high. You must be super proud, aren't you? And I said, no, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling shit about it. And that went far that I, I received official email saying, what is your concern? why are you feeling bad about it and I'm not feeling proud about it? And my answer was that you guys needed a silk scarf. You got a silk scarf. You've gone home. Project is over. I, I just got in return sleepless night. My country needs me. My people are, are needing super help. And here I am. I'm going home. The project is over. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't, I couldn't celebrate that. For me, the day had just begun. And my sleepless night has begun. The project ended. What will happen to do tomorrow? And that killed me. But that message went. And I was asked by them, write a project. What do you think you would like to do if you're given a chance? I said, eh? what is that? Me given a chance? I, I, I never had written a project before. Not of this scale of uh, my office in Banaras has 2,000 plus kilometer uh, uh, space, kilometers gap. And am I seriously looking at it? But my heart was broken. And then I did write some two pager project that this is what I would like to do. This is the way it should be. And da, 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 phone my intensity on. Next week I get a reply from them. That's, that's up. They're sending you this money. Go ahead, do what you think that it will transform people's life. And oh man, that was really bad. I didn't know that it will get real and say, oops, now what I do now? 
So I begin to work and and nine years of after working and when the movie we made I, I, and made a lot of noise basically i took this com uh, conversation around viewers community internationally nationally this de design intervention marketing intervention communication making noise wherever possible whole country had to know the banaras needed help in india it's such a large country and there's so many things happening we tend to just say file it say oh one more problem you know we have so much of a problem one more problem you're not so bothered things are changing i'm talking about in 2006 when things were nowadays it's much much different and there's a lot of attention in many ways and even the government is very committed to to support handloom of india and they're very proud of it at the same time which no government has ever been before so now 10 years uh are working after when I, 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 at one point I stopped in 2012, I stopped working with Vanaras for the reason that I, I didn't want to continue as an NGO. It's such a, it's Asia's largest weaving guild and it is a weaving guild which world should be proud of. They have a living heritage of thousands of years coded in their skill. Who am I to going to help them? But if I can help them in reaching them out to the market and repositioning them in communication and design intervention of making them more contemporary it will be my intention. So that what happened about what I'm trying to drive a point to you guys is that this, this hit me being as a professional that that I couldn't bear that I was able to see what was happening and it was bloody my responsibility to get up and act. And, and that went a little further down that it, it, when I began to work with the uh, cotton farmers and 600 cotton farmers in Tamil Nadu, the same state where I live and Oroville is, I happened to begin working with the farmers and that changed my life. I, I just saw organic mafia, Monsanto seed mafia, there's so much of a decision, GMO, India has lost 97% of our cotton to the chemicals and it was like, breathless I became I had to go and see a psychiatrist and then life was tough and I just began to ask any bloody damn thing saying what the heck I'm doing in life do I need to live can I live knowing all of that can I still be a fashion designer and knowing that my every 40 minutes a farmer commits suicide in India I mean I be human I be fair is this a growth is is this a society has built around and we are so insensitive? I just, I, I just couldn't take it. So I would cry in the dark and lock myself in the bedroom and howl and I not know what to do. But very fact that I was, I was put into a middle of this whole mess, I begin to question fashion seriously. We have been running a enterprise. Upasana had been already in business and had a very good reputation and socially conscious from day one. And we would have been called as a social enterprise. But what I was, I was seeing myself burned with the fire of injustice in a way that I had a only option of being uh, activist. I mean, of first few years of being working with that. Uh, weavers and then the farmers and and different craft communities and so on i, I was an activist and i kind of uh, sacked my business part of me and upasana and upasana somehow survived and i what point i'm driving over here is that all of us one point we go through the space of being activists and being we go radical we cry our heart are, is open and we feel vulnerable and all of that, when we, I went through that in Upasana, it really made me that I, I became more serious about what I was doing and I could see the potential of what I could do and choices were very narrow. I, I rather could shut shop of a brand called Upasana or I transform my part of fashion world and write a new story. So I chose the other one, the harder one. I could have also gone and worked in Matri Mandir or, or joined the some social community service and uh, lived a simple life, but that didn't come as Uma, you have frozen. 
Uma. Let me call her. Oh. Yeah, let me call her. Not sure she realizes she's frozen. Mm -hmm. The rest of you think of questions you would like to ask that maybe relate to your project. She'd probably have to log in again. Why don't you go ahead and have a conversation about what you have heard this far? I'm going to mute yourself, mute myself, okay? Maggie or Rebecca, do you want to just facilitate a conversation until then? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Maggie. <laughs> I, know. I think Rebecca, you're more suited too. <laughs> You must be seeing parallels uh, to what she's talking about. It's it's actually quite uncanny. Um, yeah. Hey, Monica, or Christina, or Robin, any thoughts, or Jean? The question oh that is burning in my mind is: I mean, I I get. I think we all get the uh, what she's talking about about seeing something that is so broken, and you can see sort of what needs to happen. But for me, there's that gap of, okay, how do we get there? What I want to ask her is how do you, how did she find the insertion point to begin the change? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you sort of start the flywheel moving? That's what I want to know. That's the, the big question in my mind about all of this. Yeah. And I would, I would, uh, I would add like, what's, because it seems like it, once she started to, to realize all the corruption, she needed to see a psychiatrist or like to get some help to, to support like this breakdown in a way, like to realize how corrupted uh, the fashion industry is. Yeah, like I, I wonder what kind of courage, like what, what, is there fear also? Like, you know, if there's mafia in there, like as a woman, uh, you know, the, Indian women also, I would, I would say also, like I, I'm coming from, from Canada, so I think that like everything is, is safe, the whole world, but I hear that there's different realities everywhere in the world. Like I, I see Maggie, like, like yeah, like, because in Montreal, like it's pretty much equal, you know, still there's still like, you know, only 10% of, of women leaders on top, but it, you know, still it's safe. I can walk outside at night and be pretty safe, so. That would be my question. What's the courage? What would it take? What, what did she need to overcome in herself? So um, all, yours, all those questions, I just spoke with her on the phone. She says the internet has, down, but, uh, has been down, but it says it's reconnecting. I told her to just log into the Zoom link soon as her internet is back. Um, Maggie, is there a way for her to make a call into her phone line by any chance? If she, there is no internet? She can. I can give you the number. Yeah, while everyone is talking, why don't you WhatsApp me the number and uh, I can then send it on to her. Maggie could just put it in the chat. Yeah. 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 Christina, you were going to say something? Oh, I just love Uma. I'm actually wearing my scarf for her too today. My favorite scarf. <laughs> um, I, want to, I want to delve into, because I've actually seen her presentation and been there. Um, and I want to dive into like how she um, has kind of created all these different like spinoffs um, around impact and purpose. I mean, because like she's talking about the one, but she actually has, I don't know how many, Nalima, maybe four different actual spinoffs now. Um, the Sunamaki dolls and um, trying to remember some different things. So, this, you know, that's what I want to dive into because we didn't really get a chance to do that when, uh, w when we were there. Um, but she, you know, it's basically like she finds those issues and then she 
somehow just creates uh she she goes from being in that place of frustration and then somehow she's able to create the energy and the idea and the innovation to provide a solution that solves it in a very social entrepreneurial way and i want to know more about her thought process on how she goes from that point of frustration fear and anger to inspiration and action it's beautiful monica I don't know. I'm really curious about this circularity. I don't know. It's just in my mind and I want to understand how this works because it seems to me that this is, this was, this is the way. So I just want to understand how it works. Yeah. Yeah. She didn't really go. I mean, she did. She talked about this, but like bringing it back into that circularity. Right. Right. So just for that uh, circularity was a big theme at the Mercedes Benz fashion week. Uh And it seems to me that Europe design thinking is is kind of leading uh, this whole uh, idea right now. So if you Google it, you'll find circularity and in fashion. From what I understand, they've mapped their value chain from Mm -hmm. their suppliers and the source all the way to their final customer consumer. And then they make sure that even whatever is so-called waste has a way of coming, you know, it's kind of designed into the whole process that, Ultimately, uh, the the footprint, the so-called carbon footprint and damage is minimized. And if at all, it is actually turned into uh, something even better, right? So nothing is wasted. And that the source from which you take to create your product somehow is replenished in your design itself. So it's different from our linear supply chain where someone produces and if someone consumes and then they go trash it at the end of it. Now that is called the linear uh, supply chain, right? And designers are now saying it's time to design circularity into your chain. Is mm-hmm. that making sense? Yes. Thank you for that. And I, yeah, I've recently started learning about, or I guess circularity has kind of come across my radar screen recently and it's, becoming a thing, and the good news is far beyond fashion. Yeah. Um, you know, lots of different industries. Uh, this is a widespread concept that's, that's getting a lot of attention right now, and it's very exciting. But yeah, I, I couldn't say anything more about it than just kind of the high level thing either. I'd love to hear her thoughts further on that. I'm yeah. wondering, she's saying she's having server issues. I'm thinking if I call her on the phone, will you be able to hear her? Should we try and make the most of it? We could try for sure. Okay, so let me just call her and see what that feels like. Yeah. Uh, So, you know, one of the things I have said to Raj and uh, Shubro and even John Mackey when we've had our conversations on conscious capitalism. Uma? Uh, All right, so we will wait for you to log in then. All right, bye. She she says about two minutes. Um, So let me tell you about conscious capitalism and circularity. So we used to meet in Esalen for these conscious business conclaves, uh, a few you know, thought leaders around this early idea. And one thing came to me very strongly saying, we're all talking about have a higher purpose and then create and then scale and you know, be nine times more profitable, 11 times more profitable. But I said, who is creating the conscious consumer? Who is creating conscious consumption? You know, you may have conscious leaders, conscious, uh, you know, stakeholders, conscious cultures and a higher purpose, but who is creating conscious consumption? Because it's not about becoming 11 times more profitable. It's like, who wants to be 11 times more profitable if it, if it ends up killing the planet, right? So where do we bring in an idea of sufficiency, and consuming in a way that comes at a place of enough. How do we really downsize our needs so that companies aren't just creating for the sake of creating? You know, um, 
this is where circularity comes in. And uh, one of the things all of us could do is uh, understand how we can help bring the idea of circularity and conscious consumption into the conscious capitalism movement. This is something Christina Long put, you know, even Rebecca, just start being open to that. And since fashion seems to be leading the way, because they're so, you know, the more uh, responsible among them, like an Uma, and I met many of them in Sri Lanka, uh, they are appalled. Uh, it's much like saying I work for the, you know, cigarette industry, you know, it's these, they are deeply feeling uh, a, a sense of shame and accountability for how can we be part of uh, an industry that is the second largest polluter at a time when sustainability and environment is the number one crisis we are facing, you know, like what, what does that make us? Um, we can learn from them and uh, whatever they come up with, is something that can be cross applied to all our businesses and all our enterprises. And, and that it's, it's a, it's a way of life and attitude and design thinking, deep design, you know, that has to go into whatever we are creating. So. I actually think it's, it's great that it's the fashion industry that is really seized on this because fashion is so top of mind. Um, you know, if they're focused on that message, it's a great way of, of just really pollinating it across society. Actually, while we are waiting for Uma, the other big thing that is top of mind and massive is food, right? And the lady I've invited is Chandani, who is just a, a guest listener right now. But Chandani, if you want to just unmute yourself and tell us how you are responding to all that you heard, given your concern about food yeah uh, thank you nilima uh, it's such an absolute pleasure and privilege to be here today i'm so glad that i could join in and hear such beautiful voices and be a part of this conversation so yeah so if i was just thinking i don't think any industry is untouched from this whole from this whole scourge of 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 you know completely unconscious consumption. I, I think it is really enlarged to the extent that the consumer base is. Actually, it's, it's, so the, if you have a large consumer base of a particular, like food, for example, is, is something that is appealing to a larger consumer base, let's say. And, and that would be the extent of uh, corruption in it. It's ironically like that. So um, what I'm trying to do through Earthcraft Shop is how I could actually introduce plant-based and conscious food and actually make it fun. So how it could be, so, uh, so consumers don't really have to alter any, any significant behavior. It just kind of slips into their day-to-day uh, -day, uh, by, you know, actually creating categories like so-called indulgence categories like cheese and shakes and chocolates and, um, you know, yogurt. The consumers love this. So how can you actually give them, how can you change the world through love, actually? How can you give them something without telling them that, hey, you know what? You're actually damaging and you're killing the planet and we are at the verge of extinction. Against that, how can you just tell them, hey, say, oh, fine, so you love this. Why don't you, by the way, look at, something which is more appealing and it's so it just slips into your without altering because you know uh, there is one part of trying to correct the supply part of it uh, and the other part bigger part is how the consumers as long as the consumers will continue as long as there is a demand and the consumers will continue to demand for it i don't think we can solve the problem so i wanted to i wanted to address it from the consumption perspective um, and how we could actually indulge them, if I may say so, with a far superior alternative. So that's really what I'm trying to do. Uh, Thanks, Chandni. I love, I love the way you're explaining this, that some of us need to change the game. But yeah. in the meanwhile, some of us can just slip in products yes. that are created in this very conscious way. And yeah. the consumer doesn't need to know the difference. Yeah. They just continue yeah. consuming but we know that they are now consuming in a way that is healthy for everybody. 
yeah exactly so that's what i wanted to trick them i wanted to just not because i don't have much talent of being an activist yes. so uh, and i've actually been able to do that and i see people celebrating it just the way they do and they feel wow it makes me feel good and and they you know quietly but surely start substituting there other because the worst the i think the worst challenge the humanity can face is altering anybody's behavior it's mm-hmm. almost impossible <laughs> to achieve that you know i i came across this study in which a group of patients who had gone who 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 had undergone multiple heart uh, conditions and various procedures and they were like it was a research set and they were given maybe uh, you know another two weeks to change their behavior or else die you know with all the surgeries and everything and you know after two weeks nobody as absolutely nobody had the courage to shift their behavior because they said oh i have only two weeks to go so you see it's a strange uh, yeah. yeah it's a real research it's it's yeah. so they so you can tell keep telling people that we have 350 million more people to feed and you know we have 60% of the plant and animal species are extinct today because of our, the way we've consumed you know it just doesn't move it doesn't move the needle at all no thank so, you janni um yeah. i'm just calling it a halt here because i see yeah. we have uma sure. back wonderful yeah. and thank you for giving me the opportunity yeah thank no, you no and we be more in touch with you and we perhaps do another call with you around your right. work which is amazing yeah. But thank welcome, you welcome back uma and uh, we had a nice conversation actually we were discussing questions for you so mm-hmm. maybe i will throw it open for these women to ask you questions but i have one last question for you which is it's not just conscious fashion that you are doing and really looking to be the change um yourself first and 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 then through the work you do um you're also innovating a new business model you're innovating a new revenue streams so can you quickly tell us what is the revenue model of uh, upasna you live inside oroville so how do you pay the bills how do you earn money and who who gets a share of it okay so uh, i kind of had to uh, i was my uh, the phase where i was more of a broken heart and getting into action i complete the story and get into what you asking this question will that make more sense so that that things like little incomplete that i just had left it like this sure what what, what happened is that uh, when uh, potential was in front of me and uh, only thing was left is that if it could be uh, it, if i could transform it and if fashion is the most transforming space i'm not so sure and there's so much happens over there we we claim to be the uh, one of the most creative industry even now fashion is one of the most creative industry today even now which is which is i've thought that catch the snake by this tail if this is what they are if and our, our whole uh, kind of our search of aesthetics and beauty it is so deep in all of us that we love to wear clothes and good clothes and we want to look good how do we make this more conscious and then it became everything became very easy let's take people for what people love and make it more conscious and then let's talk about it so when i begin to design became my vehicle and initially one point that i was i was more i had drawn into activism for the reason and and a need of me searching that dimension in my life i also saw that i had this power of creativity and fashion and beauty and and wanting to search this beauty which has a possibility to become whole and then things really really changed for upasna and today that we have become a one of a conscious conscious brand not only conscious brand in india we have become a center of conscious fashion hub so anybody in india talking about fashion becoming more conscious the needle comes to us the arrow is is pointed to us sitting in the forest and that i find it amazing that our own capacity that if we really begin to move needle there is no end you really you really can attract the whole of the world and and that power is 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 huge being in oroville where there is no no ownership in in our collective living there is no ownership so even that i have created upasna and i run five six social project and one fashion brand and 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 a lot of community things and so on 
nothing of it is mine and it's a little challenging a bit frightening sounding but it's actually very nice to be in that space where truly focus is on good and focus in something bigger than life than what's mine and how can what's there for me the whole search sometimes occupies our life is when we are so caught up what's there for me so it's as is a business model uh, for most of my staff we are a team of uh, 40 40 50 people today uh, in inside upasna and some of us are living in the community some of them are coming from outside villages and are beneficiary in different projects are in couple of hundreds but as a core team we are working in in our village of 50 which is uh, for us it's a different model of functioning but not for our our staff uh, no it would be same for them <laughs> what our focus has been is uh, making all the processes as a learning space and taking advantage of it and taking advantage of uh, is of uh, in a way that can i give these processes also for some ngo to plug in and and get livelihood can these processes will be given to this sector and make some difference over there so in decision making we have taken a lot of these steps apart from that we also looked at organizational uh, possibilities of uh, inspiring people getting into full potential space and letting people lead so couple of experiment in in, in level of finance sunamika project ran on gift economy in a very large scale so that became caught a lot of attention but in in uh, in many of projects which is a uh, part of upasna apart from the brand which is we have and some of these uh, social projects are bigger than the my company or brand itself so they are huge and uh, they all operate in a different uh, models and uh, as an ngo as a social enterprise or as a gift economy model and meanwhile upasna brand is constantly pushing uh, with a very good quality product very good aesthetics <laughs> and and uh, beauty saying you also support a fashion which is worth supporting so the world of fast fashion where jara is trying to sell every 15 days a new beautiful top to you in a dirt cheap price we don't know how expensive that is and and this conversation to take that with people that do you really want to care about that life is precious and you can't fool ourselves with buying so unconsciously for what and where does it end so i now see that this whole entrepreneurship has given me a leverage to education platform we are able to talk something we are able to exercise beauty we are able to empower people we are able to generate money and so many things happening at the same time and and we are profitable company we are rather people are looking up to we have a whole line of volunteers and and people who want to come to upasna we can't take them and we can't take it. we are only 50 we can't take 500 people so that's not possible it will be logistically a little difficult so now uh, i have I've decided to uh, look at it that what impact i'm going to make fashion is a, is a, a, a big sector so if i'm able to create more of a social enterprise or conscious fashion brand in india alone will that be my contribution if i enter into the, the sector of education and I start transforming where the next students are going to when they become professional what is their uh, their contribution to society will uh, will be if i can tweak into that space will that be my contribution so i'm i'm looking at not only growing horizontally but also leveraging <laughs> onto the vertical space of growth and looking at the potential where we all have or upasna has as a brand today what we have is a huge social credit and and not as that we are company very big we are rather small company but our social credits inside india in europe outside india in other places are big how we take good advantage is what my current focus is so i'm i'm focusing on education i'm focusing product of course it is it goes on there are my team is looking at distribution and outreach for scalability part of opasna and same time that if we can hold 
this inspirational space where so much is required and uh, we're doing good. I just finished a conference in February where 70 professionals came down from all over India and participated. My only target was that in five years down the line, if India has 50 more social enterprise working in textile, craft, and fashion, you, that's where we go. And that's where we transform. So it's happening. It's, it's going. And uh, yeah, now more specific question, I'm ready. Thank you, Uma. And, uh, you know, you already represent the four tenets of conscious capitalism, you know, that Raj Sisodia and John Mackey and a bunch of people have come up with that for a company to truly be a force for good and to, uh, for, you know, to, to be able to elevate humanity through business, they follow four tenets. One is they're created by conscious leaders. Two is they have a higher purpose beyond profit. Three is that they create cultures built on love and care and inclusion, not fear and politics. And four is that they have done the circularity in their own way. They have mapped their shareholders uh, and stakeholders in such a way that they make sure everyone wins, um, including the planet and the environment, because they exist, right? Because this company exists. So you're already a conscious company. You already are a Shakti leader in the sense you represent the five uh, elements of Shakti leadership. You're present. You come from Shakti, which is a true power and higher inspiration. You are psychologically whole. You've done the inner work on yourself. You know how to pivot and flex. You know, you can bring on your Kali energy. You can bring out this amazing mothering Lakshmi energy when you feed God knows how many people mm. eat Sunday in your kitchen. I've seen you do that. Mm. You know, you have this wisdom of a Maheshwari. You bring on the, you know, fashion. I mean, every little stitch on, on the, the clothes you sell is so beautifully and carefully done, you know, that attention to the last little, <laughs> right? That Saraswati energy. So you kind of f show the flexibility and you're so congruent. Uh, you know your higher purpose and yourself is aligned with that higher purpose. You've done the heroine's journey, not once, but I'm sure many times. You've died and come back. You and I have shared many such stories, um, including what someone was saying earlier on the call, right? That uh, you've been a partner with someone. I think Jean was sharing that, you know, when you work with another man or whatever, sometimes you just end up being invisible. And then how do you come into your own around that? Um, so you've done all of that. So the reason I'm think I asked Phyllis to join us on the call today. Phyllis, are you there? I know you're muted. I don't know if you're listening. But Phyllis came to see your Upasana place and I thought maybe she can ask, begin by asking a question to see how does your work fit into the matrix of peace, which is something she's going to share with our group on our next call. So how do you become a peace builder uh, through your work, right? Uh, how does your work impact the other two sectors, right? The, 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 the civil sector, the public sector, the private sector, these are three sectors the Matrix of Peace talks about from a place of consciousness. So Phyllis, how can you ask a question in such a way that we get to see Upasana and Uma as peace builders? Yes, I'm on the call. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey. Okay. All right. Um, I'm thinking that came I was so into the I was thinking whole systems Uma as you were talking and yeah. the 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 movement within the matrix of peace model that it works from is working from the outside sectors into peace coming through them and co-creating justice prosperity and sustainability hmm. and so the model presumes that if you have those three outcomes that you have the sufficient and necessary conditions to co-create a sustainable piece which means that you might get out of balance but you you can if you have the conditions for justice and prosperity and sustainability that the system will self-regulate 
and and rebalance itself into a sustainable, peaceful ecosystem. So my question for you is of those three outcomes for justice, prosperity, and sustainability, is there one of them that was the hardest to incorporate into your daily business? Like to, to, to I, I know you're working on sustainability that was really huge, the way that uh, the circular um, movement, especially Earl, Oroville, which is all about sustainability. Um, and I know, I don't know whether it might have been harder to, to move, to enjoy the prosperity from your work to that it got priced well enough to keep you moving uh, or whether that, you know, you came from a justice standpoint. I, I wondered if you could talk about one or two of those, those okay. conditions that lead to peace. So Phyllis, I see it in a, uh, like, uh, I have reflected on that, uh, that question and uh, kind of uh, thrown myself here and there. What, what I saw that uh, in, in the current dimension, the how we have chosen our product category, I'll give you a very, very product centric angle first, and then we go into the other dimension. That uh, we, uh, in, in uh, fashion is, is the most polluted industry is because of the chemical we use in our dyeing. So 2 million color option we give to our client and we lure them with so-called the fake sense of beauty and aesthetics. And that's where the whole pollution begins. And we, some of our waste are equal to nuclear waste. So Basna came up with a line which is of healing textile. And this textile are so wholesome. And it is so charged with the goodness of herbs from Ayurveda. And the color has been taken from Tulsi and Neem and red sandal and pure indigos and so on. And these are, they really not only transform the sector which has threatened the whole world to the blink of being so disastrous in a, in a way that the intensity of chemical point of view, that we have transformed it totally and not only transformed it, we, we took it ahead in, in a notch plus plus that you can have a beauty which is not only whole, but is healing. If, if skin is our largest organ, why do we put a loaded with the so much of information which is not even good for us? So this, this we, we did it successfully. And the second thing we did was that 30% of the fashion business in general is of accessories. So I see Christina wearing one of the Pasna shawl and I'm very, very proud. So it's uh, what I'm saying, this is whole sector of accessories, which is pouches and bags and, 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 and scarves and so on we have given the sectors 100% to the social sector. And we just say, this will only come from this sector. It will not come in any other ways. We will not acknowledge it. So we do, we have a community centric design as a process where our design team, they go and we go in and live in the village with the community. We just be with them and, and look at their, their skill and, and transform that skill in creating something which can, fashion can adapt as accessories or or, or, or whatever it can be. A beautiful product though. So imagine the 30% of our turnover comes from, it is committed 100% given to a sector and where there are women's group, there are NGOs, there are leprosy uh, community trying to do weaving and so on. And this whole transformation has taken place. Now what we have done is that uh, India has lost 97% of our own indigenous seed of cotton and it is all genetically modified. So we have started creating a collection which is patronizing this 3% and our commitment is to make this 3% grow 30% in our lifetime, which is I'm giving 30 years from now. And, and that where it, it has changed. We are, we are part of a national seed movement in India patronizing everywhere we can do and, and, and doing it mainstream in fashion, making this product sell and, and, and do communication and do this building of consciousness that any youth wants to be today and talk about being patriarchic if, if that's what we want to do. Sometime in India, the song sings very well that what is made in India and so on. So we have a product which is truly Indian, not only made in India, but the 
seed which is our own, we have not yet, uh, uh, not have lost it fully. But country like India losing its seed in cotton for 97% is a, a story. If it is not peace story, then what that would be if you transform this? I and mean, this is a very, very primal life energy depends on. And that had been violated. So intervention point of that, that the seed belongs to farmer, it belongs to land and does not belong to Monsanto to begin with. And if it is, if it's our skin where our beauty is given to back to us and the chemical, and if I transform that to healing, that's another intervention. And if the sector of, of the product is consciously giving to the community to do and, and take over 100%, and only job we are doing is to make this smart communication and design aesthetics, maintaining it and making this journey of that community to go forward. For me, these are, these are my peace contribution. This is a very wounded industry. It has so much of a pain and a sorrow and, and so much of ex exploitation, which is not talked about. And that to transform it. And we are not doing it because we have, we want to tell, say ourselves saying, it's, it's a part of our marketing strategy. No, this is what we will do. And if we will manage to sell it, this is what we want to sell it. And nothing else we are interested in. So it has become a culture of taking this responsibility to, of the sector we belong. It, today it happened that I belong to a, a fashion sector or textile and, and, and fashion and, 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 uh, and craft in, in my country. And it is my point of intervention with a larger story of sustainability as an Indian. I'm sure it might not sell in the international front as it is, but me being uh, living in India and being Indian and being committed to where my nation um, stand for, I deeply believe that in India and China does not change their home behavior. Rest of the world sustainability is just a talk. We will not transform. And, and, and for, with that commitment, I took a business decision of not doing export. I had nothing to sell to anybody, but I had a lot to tell, talk to my own people in my own country. So I took a business risk of saying, I'm going to work in coming years in, in, in Indi Indian market for India, and I'm going to take this conversation very seriously. And it took me seven years, and today, we, we, India is talking about conscious fashion, talking about conscious business, conscious this, conscious that. And I, I, I just pat myself saying, you know, buddy, that was a good decision. We didn't make more, loads of money, but we didn't make, we didn't lose it. We ex still exist, and company, now that has pitched in, in a, such a strong brand in our nation, that only thing is left for us to go to the rest of the world saying, hello guys, we are not just another piece of cloth, but we are really talking about that you have a power to change when you exercise it. And reaching out with that awareness to, to people. And I believe that it is not money we are lacking, it is inspiration we are lacking. And there are out there, millions of people want to support something which is worth supporting and they exist for us. Are we there to go and say, here we are? And these are the ones have changed us and have filled me with gratitude that if I need to die today, I'm, I'm happy to go, I have done my part. And I'm, I'm not going to stop it, but I do feel very complete in life. And, and that's beautiful, that's my, really grateful for. I'm, I'm really deeply grateful for. Uma, you really are something. And uh, I love the way you spoke to how you're doing sustainability, prosperity, and justice. Just so simply, powerfully, directly there, you know. Uh, and Phyllis, I, it's just so delight, delightful for me that you have a model and she has a practice and this is how you see the two mapping so beautifully into each other. And, uh, you know, the model rings true because you see a work like Upasana's, right? Um, just amazing. Thank you. Uh, we, we have time to go until uh, another 20 minutes if people would like, because this is such a rich conversation and we lost Uma for some time. So I know there are lots of questions. Uh, anyone wants to go next? Robin. Yes, Robin. 
Yes, um, Uma, I, this is very inspiring, uh, to say the least. And you may have, I think you, you may have already answered the question I'm about to ask when you were answering Phyllis's question. But the burning question in my mind is um, when you see <clears throat> a broken system that desperately needs to be fixed, how do you find your insertion point or your leverage point to start the motion of change going? So I, I, I see my positioning and I see my integrity space that what it is is where I am in my authenticity able to stand up in such a messy space. I need a leverage point. I need one point to put my feet and stand. And, and often that I look around and, and, and actually have, have strategize my position to, to stand in my integrity and in one space. And once I have my feet on, I know where to take the next step. So this has like initially when I, there were a couple of strategic decisions I took and very, very uh, dangerous one. One was uh, to cut down all my export buyer and saying, bye guys, see you in the next life, you know? And, 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 and it was like, what? You don't never do that. But I had to, I had to. I was just a, one of the chief supplier to them, you see, from India. I was just doing job work for them. It was, I was nobody. And I had, my life was not for that to be wasted of making a, some production for someone. I don't even know it, but the guy is going to just pay me. Company is going to pay me. The whole world is doing that. So this, some of the strategic decision but I could see future in another way. And I kind of gave my neck to be slaughtered if that was a way. But I, I, I just say it's me and I'm coming over there and I'm going to make this and I'm going to try it. I'm going to risk my life. I'm going to risk my business. I'm going to risk my existence. And when in when 2011, when Upasana went as a Paduti as a brand and went organic and says India's local organic brand. And you know what? We collapsed kind of went bank bankrupt. Every rupees I had in my organization was given to this brand. And I really thought that was the best thing I could do. And I did, and it did not sell. Nobody was interested in, in, in ethical fashion. Nobody was interested in your pomegranate color and, and uh, some of these sad looking things. And they would say, oh, lovely story, Uma, but where is my green pants, you know? Can you give me my pink shirt? And, and we were in that space. So. And I, I was like, I was standing in my total authenticity. I had given every part of my being in, and the level that I had emptied my every, uh, my pocket in even every penny was put on the stake, what I believed in. And it didn't, it was not people's interest. No, but none of my buyers were interested in. And that woke me up. That woke me up that, you know, there's something called financial responsibility and maybe it's time to look at it. But I, I didn't have to address that. I, I addressed it into standing in that agony and pain and bankruptcy. And I thought that power was made of us not today that nobody can take away that space. Nobody. Today we can command. Today we can see that saying, you know, guys, sustainability is a new black today. I'm so proud of all of you. But I've really gone through the journey and walked alone when it was not fashionable and people went bankrupt. And, mm -hmm. and I see this energetic power which we hold and can command today and celebrate that it really gives me joy when somebody succeed doing good. That I know pain of it and I see the need of it. And I see that in the world of today, it's not about me being a star but me being one of the star, it's a time for larger constellation. And I welcome that. Thank you. Thank you. I got a lot out of that answer too, Robin. Anyone else has a question? Christina. Yes, Christina. Hi, Emma. <clears throat> so I was sharing when you went off the line that you have a lot of different projects that you've spun off, like the Sununapi, uh, Sununapi dolls and, 
Yeah, so I, w I wanted to, I think it kind of goes to Robin's question a little bit too, a good segue is when you see that insertion point and, you know, kind of how you go from being uh, deeply um, hurt and impacted and sad at what you're seeing to turning that into the inspirational idea and an example of some of those things that you have done um, that you've spun off from Upsana. Yeah. So the question you are asking is, uh, how did I do that? Or just, just make your question one more time. Explicit. Yes. So when you see that need and, uh, and then you come to where you come to the point of being really frustrated to actually innovating and creating a new uh, project or entity or something um, that branches off from the clothing line, uh, right. but uses that, that, that support system that you have and just kind yeah. of given examples of those ideas that you've taken into reality. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's a very, very broad question you asked and, uh, so maybe I can, uh, well, maybe let I me got, see. I got I got the, okay. You, you got it. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm trained as a designer and, uh, in, in, in design study, every problem is given to us to look at as an opportunity. And I see that as a, as a, it's a, it's a disaster and a space of confusion or crisis is just a, a very creative space of, of coming up with something new. It's a space of emergence. So that standpoint, as, a, as my professional background has given me so much leverage when tsunami had hit and there was catastrophe and the global community as humanity, we were traumatized. It was a, the largest trauma that sensor has recorded and it in the a space of empathy was was high for more than seven days generally this empathy space collectively is for a few hours and then it goes down but during tsunami the sense of empathy was seven days up in the high in a very high uh, there is a what is this magnetic field reader uh, uh, nilima where the new technologies are doing so I, I i knew about that data that there was a huge impact in space what we were in india creating that if this is a space of a destruction and there was so much sorrow, I'm going to convert and create a symbol of hope. And symbol of hope will come from raw material, which is even waste. So I took a waste of a fashion industry, a small tiny bits, which just goes to the landfill. You can't do much about it, just very tiny pieces and created a symbol of hope and called, called her a living symbol, Tsunamika and handmade by the fisherman community, the, the woman who live by the ocean, the woman who, who, who wants to write a new story of their life. It wasn't a time for talking about love story, but it was just a time to talk about love story. You see that, how, how do we approach the issue? That there was so much of a trauma in the atmosphere that uh, when would you talk about love story, if not that, and when we talk about symbol of hope, if not then, when, when the millions of people were confronting the deepest, deepest question that they were not even interested in life. My ladies were not interested in life and I just wanted to make them more interested in life. And how would I use design to reinforce their, their faith in life itself was Tsunamika Project all about. And when I created that, there wasn't any vehicle which will do that, will allow me to carry this message there wasn't any vehicle. People were talking about how much this doll is for. And I said, what? And what was hitting me and calling me that if she has become a symbol of hope, who is rich enough to buy hope? And who is slimy enough to sell hope? I can't do that. I can't do that. 15 years down the line, People saying, if she is a symbol of hope, who does not need hope today? Would you translate the story in Arabic? Can I send it to Syria? Can it go to US? There are a lot of people are looking for hope. So when what I saw was that I had plugged into a much deeper space of oneness. 
through a very tiny intervention point called Tsunamika, this doll, which is, has nothing in it, but it, it has plugged itself in in the space, which was greater than any of us. And I, 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 I bore down in that space and gratitude that, thank you for allowing me to see this. It's sacred. The another project of Upasana was when I took the textile as an intervention point of talking ecology and said, carry your own shopping bag, a smart bag for a smart planet. And these bags was given as a livelihood to villages to make it. And today there are 14 villages, women makes bag. And for us, we make campaign. We don't make bag, we make campaign. And campaign creates a livelihood but the nation gets a product which is coded with a message saying, carry your shopping bag, dude. How are we going to continue this way? And I, again, I just see that as an intervention point where bag becomes much more than being a bag. Everybody has a bag. But how, how, we, how we just change the perception and, and in, in Nilima's way, I will put this, this lift the consciousness from level A to level B and level B to level C, and a very mundane act becomes sacred. And, and we were able to touch that point, and I, I, I'm very fortunate of that, and I, I'm aware of it, and I feel, uh, I feel very, very honored that it's the sense of reflecting in the processes and seeing that deep sense of oneness, you can touch it through a very material object of, let's say, a little teeny mini doll or, or small steps back and or ent entering into space of heritage protection and communities, indigenous communities right, which was Varanasi Viva's project that how can these ones who made clothes for royalty today, where are the royalty? Where are the patronesses? And if the kings are not there, aren't we the king? Aren't we the one who will patronize them? Can I call for the new kings who are asked to patronize their own craft community and honor them? But they lost it. They lost it with the kings. But aren't we the biggest kingdom we have? The whole middle class is a king kingdom space today. So these are the steps we were we were kind of uh, invoking to to take that step. And then in the, the when the farming community and so that that happens where it led me to go conscious in, in, in fashion in a serious way. And we could make that call. We could make that call that if somebody, even fashion gives you today to, to empower yourself and empower others, are you signing in? And that has worked. I, I am not sure, Christina, I did answer your question. I am a storyteller. Just no, you answered. You answered it perfectly. It resonates, I think, because, you know, it's, it's when, we're when we're thinking about, well, I'm going in the business of making money, right? It's really going, yeah. I'm in the business of making this impact and the money comes later. It's, yeah. it's the purpose. It's the inspiration. It's the what's the change we're going to make in the world. And then from a place of authenticity, that will lead to how yeah. we build that sustainability. Because I think that's the important thing, right? Is like we think about sustainability, sustainability, sustainability too much on the front end. And it's how do we make that shift in creativity and innovation to think about the inspiration, the impact, and have faith and come from a place of abundance that, you know what, we'll figure out the sustainability if it resonates. True. So it was beautiful. True. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Uma. Uh, was there one last question? Um, Rebecca, you had some things, right? I have so many things. I'm wondering if you can, <laughs> but maybe I can, I can ask you if you might give me some time another time. Um, I, 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 early in your conversation, I was so incredibly struck by this thought that the farmers are taking their lives and how that must have been devastating on, on several levels. Um, how did you sort of, how did you take that and create inspiration from that? Because I, th that is, it 
several levels of hardship. So uh, how did that, how, how did you utilize that or how did you focus on that or um, that, that just struck me as, as a turning point of, of epic magnitude, so. So Rebecca, it wasn't, a, it was the hardest thing ever in my life that has happened that I have been doing a, a community intervention for many, many years, but I never had to run into a seed mafia and, and big stories of internationally what's going on and, and what is farming community is going through. So I was dumbstruck. I just felt that I was kind of playing with that, uh, uh, in the garden with the small bugs. And here I was sitting with a lifetime monster and I had no idea what I was confronting. with. So it was horrible. It was, it was scary. And, and, and to, to confirm that it was in front of me and I had to look at it and, and feeling utterly vulnerable, utterly vulnerable. That what can I do? What can I do? And only thing I could think of was that change my tiny space of me or my sense of fashion, just change that and not just give in. I, I had an option to just give in and say, you know, I quit. I quit. This is deadly. This is, I cannot even comprehend, forget it. So I'm, I'm quitting. And that was the only option I had. So instead of that, I said, you know, I will paint my, my little canvas and my little canvas fashion will be conscious and my my little canvas farmers will not commit suicide and my little canvas weavers will not die hungry and my little canvas you see i started painting in nature painting in that moment just to survive and what it did that this became a kind of a reference that if this painting has a space how can we make this painting big and me and, and nilima had been talking about it that how we take this shakti Shakti kind of line and, and, and make it that a conscious, powerful line that it is as a message. We, nobody's walking naked yet. So we have a still an intervention point of clothing in our hand. So might as well we use it, right? So I, I have just created a, a, a world of a little miniature reality of me where I, I perfected everything I could do. And then I saw that it has a blueprint of making it much bigger. And it has a possibility, it has a blueprint which says it is doable. So all the big companies should just look at it and say, guys, don't have to exploit so hard. I mean, are you conscious? Are you conscious that world has a single saying we can live together and in enjoy and in beauty and in empathy and equality and justice? It is possible. And that is what I saw that that little miniature painting of mine was not such a bad idea but transforming this and you know sometimes we just belittle ourselves and saying who am i what can i do but even just being the drop in the ocean i didn't realize that it has so much power at least when i was dipping so low i really thought you know lady just stop it just stop it but I, I, I just something in me said, uh, I'm going to go and I will do it for the mother. I'll do it for some, for my, whom I adore and I'll just do it as a trial and rest. I don't know. Divine knows better than us. We are just mortal humans. What can we do much? But I'm going to do my best and kick this ball off and just see where do we go. And, and that is what we are discussing right now as a brand over here, Opasna and that courage to stand up and saying no matter what I'm going to paint this little canvas just to sleep better for myself so farmer's story was so horrible I just I lost my sleep I just didn't know that if life is not so unfair I'm not part of it I can't play this game and 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 that gave me courage of saying okay Okay, here we go. Here we go, we'll do something. And I became very conscious of everything, every decision I took. And that has changed us. Just sense of care, that if I care for you, why would I give you something not good for you on your body? And if I care for you, why would I let my farmers die? 
If I care for you, why would a beaver go hungry? If I care for, why would this fashion industry will get up and become a little bit more responsible? And that's what I did. Thank you, Uma. That's just so powerful. And um, since we are on the hour, um, I just want to kind of close it and, you know, with, with what's coming to me as a summation that um, we talk about the seed and the soil so in, in, the, in the Tao tradition that for something to be complete, the seed needs the soil and the soil needs the seed. And in this, in this Shakti dialogue, this is literally the thing, the seed of Upasana needs the soil of an Auroville, that it needs the Shakti soil of the mother and having created an Auroville for an inspired entrepreneur like a Uma uh, to be the seed who can grow in the soil. So um, you are, you and Auroville are in a way uh, together the success or the reason for the success that you can share today. You know, uh, if you were yourself somewhere else and you did not have mother and Shakti and the community of Oroville and the kind of inspired teachings that were are living there, then your story may have been different. That is my sense of gratitude that, you know, you are the inspired seed and you have the inspired soil. And then together, look at the magic that's possible. And the reason I want to call it out to this group is we don't live in Oroville. But Shakti leadership is based on the same power and inspiration that Auroville is, which is the integral yoga and the idea of the Divine Mother as the grace and the force behind all creativity. Right. And for us to be in an attitude of surrender and instrumentality to that flow of grace. Right? So we share the same thing. You know, in a way, we are all our own versions of an Uma, even though we don't live in Oroville. Uh, so this was so delightful that, you know, we're meeting someone who actually lives there, who lives the teachings and has such a powerful story to tell. So what I'd like to do is to end by having whoever is left on the call, just give us a one line gratitude to Uma as your key takeaway from today's call. Robin, do you want to go first? Inspiration in giant capital letters. Christina Lowe. Inspired warrior goddess. <laughs> Ooh. <Rebecca. Yeah. laughs> I, I'm just go I'm going to be thinking about this idea of that we are not lacking money. We are lacking inspiration. I am so totally blown away. Thank you. Maggie. Courage. That's what I take away. Thank you for that. Jean, embodied Shakti leader. Thank you, Uma. Thank you, all of you. We have, we have two more. We, uh, Phyllis. <coughs> Abundant love. Thank you. Janmi. Yes, thank you so much, Uma. You touched my heart. You know, till now, I've read so much about Auroville. I've watched a few documentaries. It, it was like the lost city of Atlantis. And it only happens in Auroville. It cannot happen anywhere else. Is the general myth that pervades. But you prove that, you no, know, what you prove to me is that it's not like some other planet and something is happening which can't be replicated. What you've created can be adopted by every little city with every, in every little, every other industry every other country. It's so powerful. Thank you so much. It's, um, it touched my heart. Thank you, Chami. And Uma, just for me to close, the inspiration for me is that each one of us as a Shakti leader can identify our constellation or our ecosystem and use the principles of Auroville to create our Auroville. Uh, a virtual Auroville or a, in, you know, on ground or use the same principles and be we have to create the soil for our seed. Uh, and, and you've shown us how. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So much love. Bye bye now. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Thank bye, you. Uma. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you so much.